do composting. <clears throat> Alrighty, everyone. Well, welcome to Let's Talk Dirty Composting One on One. I just want to begin, excuse me, by welcoming everyone to tonight's webinar. And also, uh, we're in deep gratitude for the city of Petaluma for making this event possible. Uh, my name is Corey Vignola. My preferred pronouns are she, her, and I am one of the program coordinators here with Daily Axe. I know many of you may be familiar with Daily Acts, um, but there's some new folks tuning in tonight, and I just want to give a brief introduction to um, what we're doing as an organization and what we're about and give you a nice warm welcome. And uh, I will then hand it over to Lori, who has an amazing uh, presentation for us tonight on uh, how to do composting. I know a lot of you, as we were doing our introductions earlier, you were saying your name and where you're coming in from. Uh, we were also asking you if any of you are doing composting. And I love that a lot of people's answers were not quite yet. So I'm excited for this uh, presentation tonight that some of you may be able to take some of the material and, and bring it to uh, your community, bring it to your own backyard, and uh, we're, we're really excited to, to present tonight. A little bit about us as an organization, uh, our mission is to inspire transformative action that creates uh, equitable, connected, and climate resilient communities. Uh, we are holistic uh, education-based nonprofit, and we believe in the power of our daily actions to uh, reconnect people to community and place. And ultimately, we hope that this helps to, uh, to help to heal society and our planet. Uh, we do this within a three-pronged approach uh, that we hope to starts in the soil and swells into culture and policy change. And so you can see a little bit about this right here. Um, so these are all the different brackets that, you know, Daily Acts tries to become involved in, right? So the first we try to spread solution and models through programs much like this one. We offer people skills and tools to help to grow their own food and medicine and habitat to help to conserve water and other resources to enrich their lives while having a positive impact on the planet. Um, because we recognize that meaningful change happens with collaboration, we also invest in a network and alliances theme, seen through our Leadership Institute for Just and Resilient Communities, our Youth Resilient uh, Leadership Program, such as Eco to School, and our Environmental Health Network Coal Coalition. Um, and lastly, as an organization, we try to mobilize community power to build a public and political will for climate just uh, policy reform. Um, so for over the last 20 years, we have a far and wide uh, reaching impact, but really everything starts much like we're doing uh, tonight. We're gathering together, we're coming um, as a community to talk about things that we care about and sharing ideas and dreams to, uh, to create a more resilient and equitable and more beautiful uh, community and help one another heal. So with that, um, I want to kind of pass on the, the microphone to Lori. Uh, I just want to go over a few uh, housekeeping items. Um, there are, of course, questions. Uh, there are no silly questions, and questions are naturally going to develop throughout the presentation. Um, please feel free to use the Q&A box or the chat box. Um, the chat is really fun to kind of interact with your uh, other participants. Uh, we ask that you make sure that it's set to everyone so that we everyone can see the questions. Um, and uh, we will have enough time at the end of our presentation to answer any of the questions. Um, Lori is super happy if there's, if there's a, people are asking the same question, well, I'll find a good stopping point and ask it for Lori. Um, but yeah, if, if that's all, um, we are gonna go ahead and get started. I wanna give a really warm welcome to Lori. 
Lori is an Alameda County Master Composter, Bay Friendly Certified Landscape Professional, and a self-taught edible gardener and resilient sheet mulch maven, oh, excuse me, residential sheet mulch maven. Um, she recently received a, te a technical certification from the Marine Composting School, and her mission is to connect people to the soil and all that it provides. Um, she has been happily teaching sustainable gardening classes and helping to transform yards and the San Francisco Bay Area since 2007. Um, and with that, I will go ahead and pass this to Lori. And I am so excited to be here with you tonight and to learn from you as well. All right, so let me get, let me share a screen real quick. Wait, is it this the one? I believe so. All right, it is. Excellent. Am I unmuted? I am. Well, welcome everyone. Welcome to uh, Composting 101. Tonight we're going to talk about uh, what's known as basic composting. And of course, I'd love to uh, touch upon worm composting as well, just because generally if I teach one, people ask me questions about the other and vice versa. So I wanted to cover both of them. I think they're both very key. Uh, I've been happily composting since uh, my completion of the Master Composter Program in 2006. I do both basic and uh, worm composting uh, here at my house. I'm here in Martinez. I have my, if you were to see off camera, my worm bin is right here next to my two, both of my worm bins are here right next to my front door and out my back door is where I have my um, bio stack. And I have definitely have pictures of that, that I'd like to show to you. Before I get started, I just wanted to let you know that this does not have to be any kind of a daunting task. Um, there are a lot of easy ways to correct certain things in compost pile. So if you have any troubleshooting tips, uh, uh, troubleshooting issues, or if there's anything um, that you having any, any kind of issues with, please feel free to go ahead and put those into the, uh, the Q&A box or in the chat box. I'm happy to talk to you about it. My, I'd like to encourage everyone to try. And if you tried and kind of pulled back, I want to encourage you to go ahead and try again. All right, so let's get to it. All right, so we're going to talk about why compost. We're going to talk about the many benefits of using compost as well as composting. And then I'm going to break it down into two sections. First, we're going to talk about basic composting. And then I'm going to talk about worm composting. And then we're going to kind of marry all the troubleshooting tips. We're going to talk about harvesting and how to use it. And then all my little tips and tricks about how I do it. And then, of course, there's a great opportunity at the end to, um, to answer questions. So please come with those questions. All questions are good questions. All right. So let's get started. The many benefits, of course, of composting and making compost. The number one thing for me is that building healthy soil. Healthy soil is key to any successful garden and every successful garden, whether regardless if you're doing, you're growing fruit trees, you're growing shrubs, you're growing roses, you're growing uh, lettuces or tomatoes, all of those benefits. So these are a lot of the um, <clears throat> building healthy soil tips that we have. Uh, adding organic materials, specifically compost, into your um, into your soil is going to increase this water holding capabilities significantly. Um, so you're not going to have to water as often, as well as sometimes what happens in the soil if it goes through um, periods of wet and dry relatively quickly, or periods of hot and cold relatively quickly. The nice thing about compost is it's gonna keep that moisture balance and that temperature balance on a nice little even keel. Um, when you go through these kind of back and forth between those things, between too much or not enough water or too hot or too cold, it's gonna stress the plant out for sure. And a stressed out plant, it's gonna be more likely to be preyed upon by a lot of pests because they're gonna see it in its weakened state and then they're gonna to wanna to attack for sure. Um, compost, unlike a kind of like a petrochemical fertilizer, um, it's gonna release its nutrients slowly into the soil as opposed to quickly. Um, that's very key because that way the plant can take it up naturally, kind of how we take up food naturally. We eat and sleep, but the, I'm gonna just gonna throw a miracle grow under the bus. It does everything it says it's supposed to do on the package, quick, lush, 
fast growth. And it definitely does do that. But unfortunately, imagine that you go from the from two years old to the age that you are right now in the course of two to three weeks. Imagine what kind of stress and strain that's going to definitely put on your body. And quick lush growth is the perfect target for especially things like sap suckers, like aphids or white fly. They are totally attracted to that, to that lush green growth, as I'm sure a lot of people are probably noticing now that all the new stuff, there's a lot of aphids and a lot of potential pests on the tips of their plants right now because that lush green growth, it's easy, it's quick food. There's a lot of water that's associated with it too. Uh, compost also has the ability to, if you have clay soil, it's gonna open up that clay soil. So it makes it easy to increase the drainage, increase the ability for roots to penetrate down further into the soil, which is very problematic for clay soil. And the opposite, if you have sandy soil, like I do, um, sandy soil is going to actually be clumped together. So it's going to hold on to water and nutrition a lot longer. Um, so that makes it nice and easy. Uh, basic compost is going to help kind of balance the pH of your soil, kind of bring everything kind of up to neutral. Um, the NPK, of the nitrogen, phosphorus to potassium, potassium ratio for compost is a one to one to one. So it's not necessarily for it's giving basic nutrition, but most of the its benefits, of course, are the water holding capabilities and aeration of the soil. When we start talking about things like worm castings, um, basic compost is considered more of like a soil amendment, but worm castings are traditionally, can, should be considered more of a fertilizer. Their NPK is generally a lot higher with the first number, the nitrogen number being the highest. So it's definitely high in nitrogen and should be treated more like a fertilizer as opposed to a soil amendment. But when we get to harvest and use, I'll get uh, more into that for sure. Uh, compost is gonna unlock nutrients in the soil like nitrogen, nitrogen and phosphorus and makes it available to plants for them to take it up. And then, like, like I said, in the case of worm castings, it's gonna help uh, improve the yields for flowers and fruit, as well as the kind of skeleton of the plant, the branches, the leaves, um, the trunks, stuff like that. It helps diverse waste from landfill, which is nice. So anything that's going to be end up putting in a landfill, and depending on what county you live in, um, there's a lot of um, uh, laws and regulations that don't allow things like organic material to be uh, to be placed in the landfill. But sometimes they still do use it. Um, but when it does, it breaks down without oxygen, so it breaks down in an anaerobic condition. And you'll know anything is anaerobic. You can definitely tell by the smell. But the worst part about it is not the smell. It is the fact that it creates a significant amount of methane. And that is one of our, um, one of our most hated greenhouse gases. So if you can divert the waste from that, if you can take the materials that you already have most likely in your yard, in your landscape, and recycle it, you're not even giving it a chance to kind of get into that waste stream. You're kind of closing the loop on organic waste right in your um, right in your yard. And nothing makes me happier than taking a lemon for my fruit tree. I'm going to use the lemon or whatever for whatever reason, the rind and the juice and the pulp. And then that ends up going to my compost pile and it breaks down. I harvest that compost and then it goes right back onto my lemon tree. And so closing that loop is just super key. Um, and easy, and it actually saves you a significant amount of money as well. So that's another great benefit of making your own uh, compost at home. It helps to control or release, re uh, reduce erosion um, when you uh, in introduce compost into your landscape. Every year um, here, at least in the Bay Area or in California, we have um, annual wildfires. And so we have the wildfires, all the organic materials burned away then we have our first rains and what happens? The soil takes off because there's nothing holding into place. There are no trees and no shrubs. There's no organic material. And even just using something like compost or even mulch, just spraying it on a hillside or spraying it on the soil is gonna keep that soil in place to avoid getting rushed away from uh, heavy rains. There's a lot of things that are associated with soils running away because it ends up in our waterways. And then that changes our waterways as well. So you could just avoid that by um, adding some compost to the soil. And that part is super easy. 
I talked about this briefly about reducing um, greenhouse gases. Carbon monoxide is another one. Um, also too, um, with continued use of compost on an annual basis, you're actually gonna be taking carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it into the soil where it's gonna be stored for a long period of time. It ends up becoming food for a lot of the microorganisms that live in the soil. They treat it like carbohydrates and they're gonna eat it. And as long as the soil is still not disturbed, that carbon remains in the soil for a very, very long time. All right. Then of course, the saving money. Of course, the best compost that you can um, get is the compost that you make from home. You know exactly what's going into it. You know how long it's been composting. You can harvest it when it's ready to harvest and you know for sure exactly what's been in it. And again, you're already recycling the materials that you already most likely have already in your landscape, which is perfect because that way there's no real outputs. Everything is just gonna be cycling through all the inputs. All right, so how is it done? So our basic recipe for compost is browns, greens, air, water, and a little bit of time. That gives you compost. And I'll get into what browns and greens are and the whole scenario in the next few slides. It's a 50-50 by visual inspection. So if I'm going to be building a brand new pile, I'm gonna start with a brown material and say I do four inches of browns, I'm gonna put four inches of greens on top four inches of browns on top of that. If I have two inches of browns, I can do it, or one inch of browns. The nice thing about it is it doesn't matter how much feedstocks you do or don't have. As long as you can still make that 50-50, you can start very small or you can start very large. And we can talk about hot piles and cold piles um, if you'd like. So it's very simple, easy recipe. It gets to this perfect carbon to nitrogen ratio of 30 to one. Um, for you uh, compost nerds out there. Uh, water, uh, we're looking for damp as a wrung out sponge. So if I reach into my compost pile and I pull out compost and I squeeze it, only a few drops should come out. If water is just like running down my arm, then it's definitely a little bit too wet, but that's very easy to, um, to repair and to fix by just adding some more dry material to kind of keep that moisture on a better even keel. Uh, for air, you're going to try to aerate, not turn. Now, of course, if you have a tumbler, turn is just already part of the uh, part of the equation. But if you don't, um, I'm here to tell you that turning would just be a complete waste of your time, to be honest. I mean, if you have the property, if you have the time, if you want to take all materials and move them. And what I mean by turning is a lot of people like to mix their piles together. So I'm taking old material that's already composted and I'm mixing it with new material that hasn't composted. But in a basic compost on the soil situation, as I make my pile, all the finished compost is gonna, gonna um, kind of go down to the bottom of the pile. So when it comes time to harvest, I just have to move all the undecomposed stuff right off the top, give it a little sift because chances are there's still gonna be things that haven't broken down into it. But if I mix my whole entire pile, old with new, when the time comes to harvest, now I have to go through and sift through all the old and the new stuff. So this way I can just do it, move it aside, and then definitely rebuild the pile. So it's really about aerating it and adding air to it. And I generally use that with a digging fork. I kind of liken it to like tossing a salad, like I'm just going to get in there and try to pull things up and just release it. Because as I'm building my pile, um, I have all my browns and greens and water and it's wet and it gets heavy and heavy and heavy. And the heavier it gets, then all the pore spaces have closed off. And then when the pore spaces have closed off, that's when decomposition slows down. But by aerating it, I'm opening it up and allowing oxygen to rush in. And that keeps decomposition going for sure. So if you take anything away from this, it's all about aerating. Don't even worry about turning. And then time. It all depends on how often you feed it, how often you aerate it, or how often you feed your worms. Generally speaking, the worms do pretty much on their own. So in about six to nine months, you can expect to start harvesting castings. That's the finished product for worms. But if you're doing a basic bin and a basic pile, 
then um, it really all depends on the composter. So if you've ignored it for the past year, it's still composting. It's just at a very, 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 very slow rate. But if you're out there every week, um, every couple of weeks and just interacting with your bin, then it's gonna go a lot faster. As we say, compost happens. All right. So now you're like, okay, I got a bin. Let me go ahead and set it up. So it's all about the location. Now, a lot of one of the misnomers about composting is that the compost pile or the compost bin needs to be in a sunny location. I'm here to dispel that myth. Um, the heat that's generated in composting is not generated based on the ambient temp temperature or whether or not the compost bin gets hot because it's standing in the middle in the sun. It's really about the bacteria in the middle of the pile because when you build the pile correctly, um, in the middle of the pile, bacteria starts to eat all the materials and then they start to, um, they start to uh, reproduce and it gets larger and larger pile. That's where the heat is generated uh, by the bacteria in the middle of the pile. If you can put your compost pile in the shade, uh, please do. Mine, unfortunately, I can only put mine in the full sun. So I have to maintain mine pretty often because it does have a tendency to dry out because it is in the full sun. So just kind of think about that. In the shade, it's going to be a lot cooler. It's not going to dry out um, as fast for sure. So um, in the shade and depending on the type of bin that you have, put it on the soil. You want it to connect to connect to, to soil, to dirt, uh, because it becomes this great little um, through a thoroughfare for worms and other compost critters. And they have the option of escaping when situations aren't necessarily the best in your pile, like um, citrus. I won't give my worms in my worm bin any citrus because it's an enclosed space. The acid is actually kind of very uh, detrimental to them because imagine you're just in a bucket with acid and but I can put it in my compost bin that you see there this, that's my bin in my backyard and so if they don't like the situation they can leave and go into the soil and then come back once all that citrus is kind of broken down and then take advantage of it if you are incorporating things like food scraps um, then you definitely should make your pile rodent resistant, depending on the bin that you get. Sometimes they do come with a base, but if it doesn't, then I recommend just lining the bottom and portion of the sides um, with like a quarter inch hardware wire, just like the one you see on my sifter there. Um, that way, if they're going to try to get in, they're going to try to crawl underneath and come up through your bin. But if it's that barrier is there, they're not going to be able to do it for sure. If you are just doing like a no fuss pile, maybe you're just doing yard waste and like um, green trimmings, as long as you don't incorporate any food waste in it, you don't have to worry about being a uh, rodent resistant. You can just do an open pile and do the same recipe 50-50 with visual inspection, air and water. Um, or you can do like a hoop with like chicken wire or um, uh, any kind of, you know, uh, meshy kind of um, enclosure just to kind of keep it all together. All right. So what goes in your basic bin? So when I'm talking about browns, I'm talking about something that's gonna be definitely high in carbon. Generally they're dry, kind of crunchy. Um, I have them listed here, dried leaves. That's my personal favorite. Um, straw, like wood ashes from actual logs, not like from Duraflame or any kind of treated wood. You want to definitely avoid that. Do wood ashes in small amounts um, just because it is very, um, it might mess with the, the pH in your compost. Uh, wood, branches, chipped up wood, sawdust, um, those all qualify. Again, as long as it's not treated or um, like furniture or anything like that. Uh, newspaper and cardboard, you can use those in a pinch. Um, I generally use those in my worm bin um, as bedding for sure. The only problem with it is because unlike a leaf that's kind of cup shape, so it's going to hold on to oxygen a lot longer. It's going to be, there's going to be a, a gap in there. 
I kind of like in newspaper and cardboard is like the kind of like the Pringles of like leaves. It's, you know, it's been chewed up and then now it's kind of preformed again. So sometimes it does have a tendency to kind of mat, especially when it gets wet. So if you are going to be incorporating things like newspaper and cardboard into it, I would definitely um, make sure that I'm kind of maintaining it on a more consistent basis. Because again, if it mats um, and closes off the pores, then decomposition will definitely slow down. Um, pine needles, those are always really nice to add. Um, because they are evergreen and have a tendency to be a little more difficult to break down, you're gonna wanna cut them or break them in half just to kind of expose um, the middle area too. Um, that way all the compost critters can get in there, water can get in there and kind of help break it down. And then like dryer lint from like cotton or wool loads, you know, definitely nothing at the blend. And even if it is, you'll see it because it'll still be in your compost uh, pile pretty much untouched, but you can do dryer lint as well. Um, so that was my browns. My greens are more kind of high in nitrogen and their characteristic is generally they're fresh or wet kind of green. So grass clippings from untreated lawns. And I want to be super specific with that because if you have a lawn and you do a lot of chemical work with it, whether it be fertilizing it or weeding, like a weed and feed or any kind of chemicals you put on it, um, those chemicals are not gonna be killed off in a home compost pile for sure. And then actually they're gonna end up bioaccumulating in the compost pile. Remember everything you put in your pile eventually is gonna end up in your garden. So you definitely don't wanna to try to, um, you definitely wanna to try to avoid that. So grass clippings from untreated lawns are amazing in a compost pile. Even if the, you've clipped the lawn and you have a pile and it starts to turn brown, the grass turns brown, there's still so much significant uh, nitrogen in it I'm still gonna treat it like a green because it has so much nitrogen in it. Uh, adding it to your pile that and say maybe like a chicken manure to it is gonna get you very, very high temperatures. Typically on average, most compost, home compost piles, maybe 120 degrees, maybe 125. Uh, chicken manure or grass clippings is gonna bump you up into like the 130 range and stuff. So if you're really trying to get rid of like really woody material, then, um, those are gonna be your two best friends. Unless you have access to bat guano, which not everybody has access to. That's probably the highest in nitrogen of all the, um, excuse me, uh, of all the manures. Tea leaves and coffee grounds, including the uh, paper filter. Um, if it's a tea bag and the, the tea bag itself is paper, I'll just toss that whole thing in. Nowadays, it seems like they're kind of switching out paper bags for some sort of weird plastic. Um, so just be mindful of that when you um, when you go ahead and add it. If it's still something, you can still cut the, the bag open and then just go ahead and give the, uh, the tea leaves to it. Uh, Eggshells, uh, food scraps. And when I was talking about food scraps specifically, like things like fruit and vegetable peelings or, you know, you find, you know, weird like moldy apple or something in the back of the fridge or, you know, some things get, you know, slimy spinach, all that stuff totally qualifies, especially if it's already kind of broken down a little bit. That just kind of helps the process along, makes it a lot easier for all the compost critters, including the worms, to kind of digest it kind of automatically. Um, weeds without seeds, and I always include weeds without seeds for those people who really don't have a significant amount of greens. It's not my favorite, um, but if I'm looking for something green, um, I will use it in a pinch. Generally, I depending, and of course, that depends on the weed. Certain weeds propagate by uh, by cutting or by you know just leaflets. So just double check with that. So avoid things like ivy or Bermuda grass or oxalis or anything that, because again, you don't want to reintroduce that um, into, your, um, into your garden for sure. So worst case scenario, if you need it, I usually cut the flower part off, cut the root off, and then just use the, the green part. Herbivore manures, so cow, horse, guinea pig, rabbit, chicken, um, those can all be incorporated into your uh, 
into your pile as well. Chances are you're going to be getting kind of like a combination with the herbal bar manure because you're not only going to get the, the green part, you know, the actual waste or the urea, the urine that comes with that, but you're getting a bedding as well. Usually things like straw, stuff like that, or wood shavings. So you're getting both browns and greens. So when you add those, just take that into consideration because um, there may need to be a little bit more changes because you're adding browns and greens in that same layer. So you may have to either add some more greens to comp compensate for the extra browns. And then things like hair and fur and feathers. I put my hair in the compost pile all the time. Um, you know, cat hair, just as long as there's, the hair shouldn't be dyed or processed. Um, and then as far as um, animal fur, just as long as you haven't incorporated, you know, a lot of people like to do like uh, uh, treatments like on the back of the neck, I would definitely avoid putting um, that type of stuff in, in the pile as well. All right. So let's start with building a pile. <clears throat> so you're always going to want to start with a brown. If you have like big pieces of wood, like branches or logs or something, putting them right on the bottom is a great place to start. They are out of the way. And then again, they kind of create these little tiny air pocket at the bottom of the pile. Again, we're trying to really en encourage a lot of oxygen. So they're going to stay there pretty much in perpetuity. You're going to have to recycle those over and over again, probably for several times, which is fine because their main goal is just to be here on the bottom, allow oxygen to flow through the bottom of the pile and up through the middle. So that's nice. Um, I'm going to layer the browns and greens in equal amounts, again, 50-50 by visual inspection. I'm going to add some water and I'm going to aerate just to kind of fluff it up in between the layers. So I'm going to start with the brown, greens, water. I'm going to aerate it. And then I'm going to finish with the brown. And then I'm going to continue to layer that until I'm done. So every time I take the lid off my compost pile, I should see brown material on top. At least I should. Um, because it's going to be nice and sandwiched between the greens. And the greens are pretty much what the bacteria and all the other compost critters are trying to eat, at least initially. I mean, they're all going to eat everything, but eventually um, that's where they like to stop, start. Chop, chop things into smaller materials in order to increase the surface area. Mix, again, aerate, not turn, and then maintaining. And typically a maintenance to go to the compost pile is go to the compost pile. I'm going to take the lid off. There are my browns. I'm going to pull back the browns until I see some green going to put or in the middle of the pile because the greens may be already gone. I'm going to add greens into the pile. I'm uh, depending on how wet or not it is, I may water it, but I definitely will aerate it most likely. And then I'll put browns back on top. There we go. Equal parts, browns and greens. Start and finish with that browns. So every time you see it, that's how you kind of keep that's how you keep uh, fruit flies at bay, but make sure you sandwich your green, uh, sandwich your greens in between those two browns for sure. If there is a, fly, a fruit fly situation, um, I would suggest fill up the rest of your bin with browns because make sure that of course that you're rebury your greens. Sometimes it is also if it's too wet as well. Sometimes there's fruit flies, so if you um, fill up the rest of the compost pile with browns, um, you're basically keeping uh, fruit flies from mating. They like to mate in midair. So if you don't have any midair for them to mate, then you're gonna be one, you'll probably be one generation and done, which is nice. All right, so I talked briefly earlier about hot piles versus cold piles. So hot piles are anything that's a cubic yard or larger. I have a bio stack um, compost pile um, that's almost a cubic yard. So if I go a little bit larger than that, then I would technically be able to make a hot pile. So what happens is they are, um, I'm going to build the pile. And if I build it correctly, then the thermophilic bacteria, the ones I was talking to you about in the center of the pile, they're going to start to run the show and they're going to um, 
increase in mass uh, and population and just them rubbing together is gonna generate a lot of heat. And if I build my pile correctly, it's gonna be hot for about one to three days. It's gonna shrink the pile by a good third. So if you were worried about weed seeds or any kind of pathogens, especially if you can get it very hot, um, that's always nice. Also too, if you have a compost thermometer, it's something that's kind of a fun toy. But if you have a compost pile, say with a, um, a compost bin with a lid, if you lift the lid up and you see condensation on the top, you know you're going through a hot period right now and you should just leave that alone. You don't want that heat to escape. You want that heat to just kind of be there. And once it shrinks, usually about after the third day, then you can go back and start to feed it. Now a hot pile or a cold pile, depending on what's going on, every pile is gonna go through a hot period and a cold period. When I talk about hot piles versus cold piles, it's really about how it is when you first build it. Cubic yard or more, hot pile, smaller than the cubic yard, cold pile. So everyone's gonna, depending on what you feed it, it's gonna go through hot and cold periods. And there's great benefits to both. Faster decomposition for a hot pile. Um, you get a lot of worms in a cold pile. And so the compost itself is pretty much enriched um, with worm castings. As they leave their worm castings, they eat your food scraps and leave their castings behind. So it's also cold pile compost is also great for preventing things like damping off disease. So if you've ever put a plant in, a, um, in the ground and it, you haven't done anything with it and you come back the next day and it's just all withered and gone. Um, usually there's a soil uh, uh, in the soil that's gonna go ahead and kill it. Now cold pile again is smaller, um, but you still use the same recipe. And so our average kind of day-to-day -day bacteria kind of run the show. Those are the mesophils. So you never get into that thermophilic stage. So it's gonna break down a lot slower for sure. But again, because it's not hot, you're gonna get a lot of worms. And a lot of worms, um, once that starts breaking down, they're gonna go to they're gonna go to task with it. A worm can eat half its body weight of food in a day. So if I start off with a pound of worms, technically speaking, I can feed them about a uh, half a pound of food every day and they're gonna take it down for sure. All right, so let's talk about worm bins. This is my worm bin setup. The big one and then the gray one I take with me, it's my travel bin. I take it with me um, to do workshops in person. And that's right by my front door. I have a picture of it actually. So setting up a warm bin is a little bit different definitely than setting up a basic bin. So first thing I wanna do is I'm gonna get a pound of worms. They're called red wigglers. I'm going to get my, my food together. Basically, it's just primarily food scraps. So if you're in a situation, say maybe you live in an apartment or you live in a place that you don't have a lot of, you know, there's no grass or you don't have any access to trees, uh, worm composting is gonna be a great option for you. Great way to recycle a lot of your, your food scraps. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take some paper. Generally, I like to use newspaper. Um, even if it's colored newspaper, um, I just try to avoid things like slick magazines or coupons or any kind of that. But if it's like a USA Today, even though it's color ink, it's all soy-based color ink. So you can use that. So I'm going to shred that by hand. I'm going to wet it. Again, damp is a wrong out sponge. They all kind of collate um, regardless of you're doing basic or worm composting. And then I'm gonna layer wet paper on the bottom of my bin. And you can either buy a bin or you can make your own. I have one of each. The gray one is just a toter with a locking lid. Um, I drilled holes along the top edge of it by the lip. And then I, I basically built this up. So wet paper on the bottom, about a pound of the red wigglers to start. And then I'm gonna give them probably about a quart of food. Again, eggshells coffee grounds, fruit and vegetable peelings. I'm going to avoid things like citrus or anything kind of spicy. So I don't do garlic or onions or any kind of chili peppers. Again, they don't have the ability to escape um, when situations aren't right for them. So it's always best to just make sure. And I already have a compost um, 
bin so I can divert all that stuff to an area where the worms can do. And then I'm gonna put wet paper on top and then I'm going to shred and put dry paper on top. If you don't have access to a lot of newspaper, um, I like to use cardboard egg cartons. And um, I've also heard really great things about um, as long as the paper is printed with soy-based ink, um, you can get rid of a lot of stuff. A lot of people like to get rid of their own personal information, you know, social security numbers and stuff. As long as, you know, say on the bottom of the statement or the bill or anything printed with soy-based inks, you're going to want to hand shred them as opposed to putting them in, them in a shredder. But there's nothing, nothing makes nothing disappear like a worm. And that's gone. It's not like, like burning it. It's gone. So that's how you're going to set up your worm bin. Oh, there's my bin. That's my front door. So I like to take it outside to the front porch if I ever have to harvest it or anything like that. So you can keep it inside. They like their temperature roughly about 55, 59 to 77 degrees. So take that into consideration um, when you're deciding what to where to plant it. Now, there's other bins that you can buy. Um, generally, a lot of the bins that you can buy are called uh, migrating bins, where there's several layers and one kind of insets on the other one. Um, and those are great. It just all depends on how much you want to compost. Generally, with those, people usually just use maybe one tray. Let's say maybe you're vegetarian or vegan or you're growing your own food. You may go to two trays. Each tray is probably going to need about a pound of worms each in order to kind of compensate for that. Also, two, when you buy worms, you generally, for the most part, just get worms. But you definitely need some other critters because worms don't have teeth. So you definitely need the shredders in order to break it down. So say you have a basic bin at home, I might dig around in that and take a little bit of that out and kind of inoculate my bin. Or if you know somebody else who has a worm bin, just kind of get them to grab it because you need those roly polies and a lot of the shredders. Otherwise, the food is just kind of sitting there rotting um, until it gets to the point that the worms can ingest it, but you want that to be relatively quickly. I said, you set up your bin, feed it about a quart, and then let them settle in for about a week. Um, you don't feed them, just feed them the one time and let them get situated. Because depending on how they're coming to you, even if there's a car ride or if they're coming by the mail or anything, it's going to take them a little bit of time to kind of adjust to the new surroundings. So sometimes what happens, and there's a variety of reasons for this, is um, you get what's known as worm rut. So you'll come home and there might be worms all over the lid of your compost bin or your worm bin. Or there are some instances when you come home and they're on the floor of your house. They've escaped through the kind of through the holes. Generally, a lot of that has to do with them just trying to get adjusted to it. Sometimes it's about them, um, sometimes really immature worms. And you can tell the worm's immature. It doesn't have that little band around it. It's called the clitellum. So if they're really immature, sometimes they have a tendency to, with, to do worm run as well. Sometimes worm run happens just because of nature. Like we just had rains today. I bet you if I were to go to my worm bin and lift it up, there'd be a lot of worms on the lid, um, specifically because the barometric pressure drops. And unfortunately, these worms don't know that they are sitting in my living room. They just know that they're in some sort of ecology. And when the barometric pressure drops, it signals something inside the worm to say, hey, it's gonna rain, we need to get to the top. So they're gonna be at the top of my bin. So just checking on that. And the easy way to kind of get them back on track is to take the worm bin and put it either in the sunlight or put a lamp over it and kind of force them back down into the pile for sure. And then feed them pretty consistently. Like I said, once you know everything gets going, because not only you're feeding the roly polies, but you're you're feeding the worms as well. So you're feeding like a whole ecosystem. So half a pound, you know, every day if you can, um, and give them to it. And then again, just like with the basic bin. You're gonna we'll pull back the bedding, the paper, find the stuff in the middle, and then just recover it. And then basically anything that needs to be corrected in a worm bin can be corrected with dry newspaper. So fruit flies, dry newspaper. <laughs>
So make sure you do bury those because fruit flies are no fun. Talked about this briefly, what stays in and what stays out. Uh, eggshells, I actually like to leave them whole because um, they like to collect in there if it's too cold. Sometimes you'll just find a whole bunch of um, worms kind of in together. If you keep your bin outside, sometimes if it's cold at night, you'll see them all kind of in a lump in the middle of the pile, um, just there keeping itself warm. So I would consider maybe putting it in a garage or um, like I said, I haven't had any problems with, you know, keeping it inside my living room. So if you have space for it, then certainly. So what stays in, what stays out. Example of a couple examples of my worm bin. You can see I use the newspaper and the paper egg cartons inside of that. And then all that lovely black stuff on the top. That's the worm castings. That's the finished, that's the finished product. That's that fertilizer. And I use that for everything, for house plants, um, for all my plants out in my garden. Um, give it, you know, friends, all kinds of stuff. All right. So what stays out? And this is um, for both piles for your worm bin or your basic bin. So any kind of treated wood, you definitely want to try to avoid it for sure because it contains toxins and glues and you definitely don't want to incorporate that. Any kind of charcoal, including mesquite, just because of a lot of the chemicals. Um, sometimes the ash is a little bit too much for the pile. Uh, any kind of feces from dogs, cats, or tropical birds for a variety of E. coli, toxoplasmosis, um, you name it, things that normally can't be handled under a compost, home compost situation. I avoid things like meat, dairy, grains, and cooked food, just because I don't want to attract any rodents or any raccoons to the pile, as well as when they do break down, um, you end up with those fly maggots, and they're very, very gross, unlike all the other compost critters, which I don't think personally are gross, um, but I definitely try to avoid that for sure. Anything that's oil or greasy, again, all of our compost critters breathe, generally breathe through their skin. So you're gonna suffocate them if you incorporate that. So even if it's just like salad with salad dressing on it, you definitely wanna try to avoid it. And again, it might create a situation where it might start to smell or um, you may wanna attract some unwanted critters to the bin. You definitely wanna do that. Any noxious weeds like ivy, Bermuda grass, vinca, oxalis, blackberry, keep those out of the bin at all times because a lot of them are propagate by cutting. So you're gonna be incorporating that into your garden. You definitely wanna to try to avoid that. So any toxic substance, any glossy paper, uh, any diseased plants, especially in your basic bin. Again, the temperatures are not gonna get that hot. Um, to cook it off. Less, like Again, unless you have a fair amount of fresh chicken manure um, at your disposal, um, then I might definitely chance it. But again, I also have the option of putting it into my organics cart and having somebody else take care of it. All right. Do we have, I see some questions in the chat. Do we wanna, um, do we wanna tackle any of those? Yeah, thank you so much, Lori. That's such a enriching conversation. I really appreciate it. And um, sure. I'm excited to read some of these questions. Okay. Um, we can start with uh, Liz. What is the best method to get rid of ants in a compost? Uh, mostly just to, to be on, kind of on it all the time. Ants are just there for a free ride and sometimes to bite you. But for the most part, they're just there because there's food, um, and it's a cool place for them to hang out. That's and moisture. That's pretty much it. So for ants, um, for a basic pile, I just kind of leave them be. Um, if I were in a situation where ants maybe wanted to come into my worm bin, um, it, there's a couple of things you can do depending on what type of bin you have. Usually a lot of the migrating bins have legs on them. So I might take some shallow cans, like maybe tuna cans or if I have, you know, like a wet cat food and I'm going to place the legs on each one of those. I'm gonna fill those cans up with a little bit of water and a little bit of vegetable oil. And then it kind of creates a moat that they don't want to cross. 
Um, if I don't have legs, then I can use kind of like the only thing I'd probably use like a petroleum jelly for is to coat around the base of it um, so they can't get in or they're just going to get stuck um, in kind of like this asteroid belt of, uh, um, of Vaseline. So yeah, that would probably be the best ways to get rid of them for sure. Thank you. Um, and we had someone also ask, how much water are you adding to the bin? Um, you were mentioning that you want the soil to be as moist, almost like as a sponge. And I'm sure that will also determine based on where the, where the compost bin is. Um, is there any techniques that you would recommend for how you keep your, your compost bin? What? Yeah, um, generally, I'm just going to add a little bit of water. I mean, everything's pretty dense. So if I'm there with a the hose, I'm going to water the top. And personally, I want to see some water come out of the bottom. That way, I know the water is, is percolated down through the pile. And so usually, I'll do that and then aerate it. And if it hasn't come down to the pile, um, I might give it a little bit more water as well. For me personally, I always feel that it's a lot easier to correct a bin that's too wet than dry. So even on a rainy day, especially if we get a significant amount of rain, I've been known to go outside and take the lid off and let mother nature water my compost pile. And if it's a little too wet, then I'm gonna go in and I'm just gonna aerate it. I'm gonna mix a little bit more browns in it to kind of help correct that. Okay. So yeah, if I'm just gonna water it, I'm just gonna give it a little bit of water, but I wanna, make sure it goes all the way down through the pile. Thank you. Um, and you mentioned how there's a, a differentiation between turning and aerating. Is aerating just like using your fingers and just kind of percolating it and making sure that there's holes or? I would probably use like a digging fork because like I said, I'm probably gonna wanna go down as deep as I can. Mm -hmm. And basically it's like tossing a salad, go down as, but only with one implement go down as deep as I can and kind of pop it up and then bring it up and then let it go. And then go down deeper, maybe in more in the middle, pop it up and let it go. It's kind of like literally kind of like tossing a salad. I just want to make sure that there's a fair amount of oxygen in there and, mm -hmm. and it kind of re reestablishes the layers somewhat slightly because as they kind of fall down, now there's going to be a lot more air pockets in it. So yeah, I've known, a, I knew a, a elderly lady, she just put a piece of rebar in the middle of her pile. And then she would just use it like a gear shift just to kind of open, open up access to it as well. So mm -hmm. it entirely depends on you. I've tried those kind of mixers and turners, but those things are hard to turn. Um, they're only really good for like, maybe like the first few inches of the pile. Um, but not for the entire pile, just because it just gets so heavy that you're not unable to do it. Perfect. And in the chat box, I see what type of critters other than roly polies should you be seeing? Um, and underneath that, they also asked another question. Should we be drilling or poking holes in the bin or at the bottom? Um, I'm guessing that's with worm composting. Uh, with worm composting, no, just do it on the sides um, because um, you don't want all the, the stuff to kind of leak out on the ground or in your living room for that matter. That's what the newspaper's for. The newspaper or the bedding is to kind of help um, kind of balance the, the moisture level in the bin. And again, they're worms, so they really don't mind it a little bit goopy because that's what they're generally used to. Um, but you don't want it to be totally soupy. So no, so just along the top edge or depending on if you buy a bin, a worm bin, it's, there's gonna be kind of holes in the side for allow for aeration. Um, but yeah, you just want to be, them to be able to, to breathe for sure. But no, not to leak out. And you want that, you want that to be recaptured um, into, the, um, into the bin. You never want that to escape. And then as far as Chris is concerned, um, there is a roly poly right there on the screen. So like, again, these are your big shredders. And if you look down at the bottom left-hand corner, did a little yellow object, that's a worm egg. This is a worm bin. So there's a whole ecology going on inside your worm bin where worms give birth, they lay eggs, 
Each egg has about one to 12 uh, worms in it and it just ends up repopulating the bin. I've had the same compost bin since 2007, but obviously it's not the same worms. I don't know how many generations of worms that um, have been through my bin for sure. Um, Liz asks, how do you harvest the worm casting without picking up the worms? Okay, we can definitely get to that. I'm gonna be talking about that, Liz, as we get to the, um, to the, end, to the end of it when we're talking about harvesting. It's fun and you don't have to do a lot of stuff. <laughs> the worms do a lot of work for you by getting out of the way, pretty much. It seems like the questions for right now. Okay, groovy. All right, so let's move on to compost critters. These are key in either oh, um, basic and a worm bin. These are the um, these are the individuals that do basically all the heavy lifting, pretty much. Um, fungus is uh, they perform that primary oh, pardon me primary decomposition. So you know moldy stuff. That's composting is already um, already happening. So you're gonna find yourself with some fungus. Um, sometimes you'll see in a compost bin this kind of gray cobwebby stuff. Um, that's actinomycetes, and that is something you definitely want. I mean, you both want fungus in there, but um, it's half bacteria, half part fungus, and that's what gives um, compost is kind of a sweet smell. So if you're ever purchasing compost, um, especially if you're purchasing in bulk, I will put a hand in there and I will put it right up to my nose and I will give it a good sniff. If it smells sweet or kind of earthy, you're on the right track. If it smells kind of kind of acrid or this smells like ammonia, then um, the compost itself is not completely finished. And depending on what your goal is, you have a couple options. You can definitely pass on it and not take it home with you, or you can take it home with you, take that pile, put it on top of some soil, give it a little water, and then throw a tarp on top of it. And that is gonna, what we call curing it. It's a last chance for all the organic material to kind of break down without having to deal with the addition of new things. It's left on its own to kind of finish the composting process. So actinomycetes and fungi, super key. Um, not everybody has this, um, but they're soldier fly larvae. They've been really kind of, um, they're the new rock stars of the composting world. So if I have huge amounts of like wet material, so say, you know, I harvest peaches for a living or I work in strawberry fields, I can pile up all the broken and, you know, ones that I can't sell anymore and give it strictly to soldier fly larvae and they will take it down in a matter of hours. Generally speaking, if you see it in your bin, your bin is a little bit too moist or if you're incorporating a lot of green material and they are definitely a welcome sight. They do break down that material fast, uh, insignificantly. And then eventually, um, most of the time you see it, you're probably just seeing the, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> what you see here is their exoskeleton. They're eventually going to gestate and become flies and then fly away. And that's it. But these are the larvae that you see behind. They work really hard. Worms, of course, those are super key. Again, they leave their castings behind, uh, which is basically a fancy word for poop. And um, they have a mucus film on the outside of their bodies that makes soil kind of bond, bind together, which is great because you want your soil to be a little bit chunky. If I have chunky aggregates in the soil, then between the aggregates is where water can pass through, where roots can pass through, where um, other microorganisms, water can all pass through. So you do want your, your, your soil a little bit chunky. That's why I'm not a big um, fan of tilling soil. Um, you can do a great job of building up the healthy soil without really having to disturb a lot of it, to be honest. Sow bugs, isopods, roly polies. These are the big shredders. So these are the these are the guys who are the you know 
the first line, they get that food, they shred down things like, especially like cellulose into smaller pieces, bacteria and fungus are there to help break it down, break it down to smaller amounts. So now it becomes digestible to worms. Again, they don't have any teeth, so they need everything. I always kind of liken it to like a smoothie consistency and they'll be able to take that in. And then something very magically scientific happens, the nutrition. So I could give it like coffee grounds and apple core and it's gonna eat coffee ground, broken down coffee grounds and apple core. But as it passes through the worm, it becomes the end result, literally and figuratively, becomes more um, nutritionally sound on the end. Again, literally and figuratively. <coughs> All right. Troubleshooting your basic bin. Does your bin smell? Chances are it's either too wet, um, you have too many greens, or there's an inappropriate green in the pile. So I'm going to, if it's too wet, I'm gonna add some browns. I'm gonna mix some browns in uh, as part of the aeration process. If it's a wrong green, I'm gonna pull that green out. I'm gonna aerate and I'm gonna top with a brown. Or if it happens to be too many greens, again, I'm gonna correct it with some browns. So one of the tips, and I'm just gonna jump ahead on this one is in the fall, I go around and I collect dried leaves just before the first before the first rains come. That way, in the summertime, when I'm incorporating a fair amount of wet material, melons and strawberries and tomatoes and stuff like that, and I need to keep the balance of browns and greens, I have my what I call my banked browns. I put them in old trash cans or trash bags. That way I always have a fair amount of browns to kind of help correct the pile. And I don't have to either resort to things like newspaper or cardboard or just kind of suffer and wait until fall. It comes again. All right, fruit flies. Either it's too wet or the greens are unburied. So again, I'm going to bury the greens. And if I have browns, I don't even have to pull back the, the browns and fine greens. I can just I can just layer with browns on top. Again, if there's too many fruit flies, I'm gonna fill the bin until um, to kind of stop them at that generation. So say I build the pile and I think I'm maybe building like a hot pile. I thought I got my browns and greens all together and I come back three days later and it looks exactly the same way as it did when I built it. Chances are my browns and greens are probably off. I may have too many browns and not enough greens. Um, it could be on, it also could be more moisture. So I'm going to do both. So I'm going to pull back the browns. I'm going to add some more greens. I'm going to water it and then I'm going to aerate it and then making sure that my brown's on the top. Uh, bugs, they are definitely an important part of the composting process. So if I'm thinking about bugs, of course, you know, we talked about our compost critters. Um, we talked briefly about ants. Sometimes you'll see spiders, snails and slugs. Um, everybody just wants to come and hang out. Uh, one of my first jobs in the kind of composting world was um, answering composting helpline. And a lady called me one day and said she had, the, she had this great compost pile, but there were so many bugs in it. Um, and she spread raid on her compost pile. So what could she possibly do? And I told her, unfortunately, since she incorporated um, Raid into it, she was going to have to toss the entire thing in the garbage can and start fresh. So they're important. They're important part of the composting process. So um, just be aware of that. <clears throat> unwanted guests. Usually when I speak of unwanted guests, it's usually things like rats or raccoons or possums, stuff like that, depending on uh, how close you live in proximity to um uh, creeks and nature and stuff like that. So um, check first of all to see if there's any um, thing that's going to be attracting them. So you know maybe you put some steak in there or maybe you put pasta in there. You're going to want to pull that out, aerate it, and then uh, top that with a brown. Um, again, making the bin rodent resistant is going to be key for keeping things like that out. But for, you know, especially like raccoons who have hands, you may have to bungee cord the lid or put something like a cinder block on top of the lid, something, anything to discourage um, 
anything for trying to climb into it for sure. Um, for your worm bin, um, red mites, as you can see that picture on the far right. Um, in large quantities, they do, will have a tendency to um, attack your worms and kill them. But an easy solution to that, um, as you can see on the left, is just there's a couple pieces of bread. I put two pieces of bread in my bin. And then what's going to happen is the mites are going to be attracted to it. And they're going to get off the worms and get onto, my, uh, onto the bread. So within the next day, I'm going to go ahead and pull it out and take that piece of bread and put that in my organics cart. And I'm going to keep doing that. Um, on a daily basis until the population um, decreases pretty significantly. Just don't make sure you don't leave it in there. <clears throat> All right. Harvesting um, basic compost. So how do I know what's ready? Does it look like anything that I've incorporated into the, uh, into the bin? So if I put peaches and tomatoes and uh, herbivore manure and dried leaves. I know it's ready when I don't recognize any of it. And again, with basic, it's always nice to be able to just pull off your bin, take all the undecomposed stuff, put that to the side, and then just allow um, the bottom portion of it just to be um, ready to sift. Sifting is optional. Generally, I like to sift because um, I sometimes I have to take big chunks out. Sometimes raking leaves, I'll pick up rocks, just kind of get those out of the um, out of it. So with this, I can use it right away, or I do have the option of storing it covered um, off to the side for like at least a month or so, and let allowing it to kind of finish up and kind of cure. But I can use it. I can use it right away. If I have to, just making sure that all that stuff is broken down. <clears throat> Excuse me. So for new plantings or for new beds or for new containers, I'm going to do what's called top dressing. I'm just going to lay an inch to two inches of fresh compost right on top of my soil. I might kind of rake it in slightly, but I'm not going to till it in because um, when I water, it's going to percolate down into the soil. The worms in your soil are gonna know what's there. They're gonna come up and they're gonna grab it and bring it right back down into it. So it's gonna percolate down through your soil for sure. Um, if I'm mixing it with potting soil, I'm gonna do one part compost, about three to five parts soil, which is nice. Um, when I'm planting trees and shrubs, what we call backfilling, um, I'm gonna dig the hole for the tree I'm going to mix the soil that I pull out from that, and then I'm going to reintroduce it. I'm not going to just put the compost on the very bottom because it doesn't really, the roots have no reason to go anywhere if food is right there. But if food is kind of spread out throughout, that's how you end up with those very fine, um, fine root hairs um, that come out. And then the idea is to try to force that tap root to go lower, lower into the soil for sure. And then um, sheet mulching. Generally speaking, you most likely won't have enough, if you, if you do, that's great. Um, won't have enough uh, compost to sheet mulch with and most likely you will have to buy it. But if you do, um, you're gonna do about one to two inches of compost on top of your cardboard layer, your weed blocker, and in between that and your mulch layer on the top, just to kind of create this great little sponge for water holding, um, for food, for new plantings, and stuff like that. <clears throat> the reason why I sift, all other stuff that never seems to really um, break down, weird tea bags, pits, um, and just as a heads up, squash seeds and tomato seeds never break down in the compost pile. So when you go to use it, chances are you're going to get squash plants, and tomato plants as well. So free plants. Um, the squash plants, um, I don't say questionable, but the squash plants, there is um, a possibility that whatever you enter into your compost pile as food and the seeds may germinate and be different. Um, I guess the best example is, say Corey and I, we live across the street from each other. This year, Corey is doing zucchini. I'm doing pumpkin this year. 
She gets zucchini this year. I get pumpkin this year. We save seeds or I end up putting, you know, um, extra stuff in the compost pile. And then squash seeds germinate from it. Now it could be pumpkin like I had last year, or it could be zucchini because the bees have passed back and forth between our two yards and have pollinated both. So I could get pumpkin, I could get zucchini, or I could get some sort of weird zucchini pumpkin hybrid or some sort of hybrid from some other squash plant that happens to be within like 300 yards of what my garden is. So just a quick heads up on that. I just generally sipped over the, um, uh, sipped over a, a garbage can and then I take the material and I usually just kind of set it aside or most likely use it um, relatively quickly. As you can see, there's still a fair amount of chunks in there and that's what I'm trying to sift out. Just some of the stuff that hasn't been uh, decomposed. And then I just reintroduce that as I rebuild the pile. Again, with the same recipe. Um, generally with the material that hasn't been decomposed, um, I generally like to really wet it. And because they're mostly a lot of greens, I'll really, really wet it and then add it as a green layer in addition with some new greens as well. But again, I'm still gonna follow that basic recipe. <clears throat> now, if I want to harvest my worm bin, I have a couple options. Again, like if you ever get like a migrating bin, the whole purpose of that, that style is for to ease in migration for sure. So for a migration method, I'm going to stop feeding my worms for about two weeks. I'm gonna pull out all the food that's already currently in there and I'm gonna stop feeding them for two weeks, which make worms actually a perfect pet um, if you wanna go on vacation because you can feed them and you could be gone for two weeks without even really having to worry <clears throat> about them having any issues. So chances are in a migration bin, you're gonna have an empty bin. At least you should set aside one bin to be empty. I'm gonna stop feeding my worms for a couple of weeks and then I'm gonna rebuild in my new empty bin. I'm gonna put wet paper, food, wet paper and dry paper. And now I'm going to set my new empty bin on top of my working bin, making sure that the bottom of the new bin and the top of the old bin meet. Now these worms haven't eaten in a couple of weeks. So now they're gonna migrate all the way back up to where the new food is and leaving the bottom portion virtually um, worm, worm empty. But I always end up picking through, take worm eggs out, roly polies, just kind of stragglers and reintroduce them to the bin. <clears throat> now, if you have don't have a, a, a regular bin or migrating bin and say you have a bin similar to mine where it's kind of side to side, I'm still gonna do the same thing, but instead I'm gonna take all the materials and I'm gonna shove it all to one side of the bin. And then I'm gonna have an empty portion Again, wet paper, uh, food, wet paper, dry paper. And as opposed to them migrating vertically, they're gonna migrate across horizontally to go from where area where there's no food to an area where there is food. Again, virtually leaving that pretty free. Um, there's the colander method, which I use probably more often than not. So for me, it's just really about grabbing a small hand going into my bin grabbing a small handful. I'm gonna take a colander that I have no intention of using with anything else just for this. I'm gonna put the um, castings in the colander. I'm gonna run a hose over it, um, over a bucket, and it's gonna dilute it um, into a bucket. I'm going for the color of weak tea. I think I have a slide, a couple of slides here. The color of weak tea is what I'm going for. And then I'll go ahead and use that to water. Again, um, worm castings are more like a fertilizer, so I'm not going to want to use it. So in the case of basic, I did one part basic compost to three to five parts soil. If I want to take my worm castings incorporated with soil, I'm not going to use more than 20% worm castings to that 80% of soil because it is so uh, nutrient intensive and very high in nitrogen. So it's really great for um, starting new plants. Um, so I put all my plants in 
um, for spring, and then they'll get pretty significant feedings of worm castings, especially since mine are in containers. Uh, if it's in the ground, it, you may not have to do it as often. But I'm going to go ahead and water that. It's going to provide a significant amount of nitrogen to kind of get the skeleton of the plant kind of established. And then once it starts to flower and fruit, if it does do that, then I'm going to stop using the castings, which are higher in nitrogen. Um, when that comes, my main focus is going to be mostly phosphorus for flower and fruit development. And I'm going to want to push that. Generally, I like to use something like bone meal for that. So for the colander method, again, um, color of weak tea or kind of like muddy kind of tea, I'm going to use that into water and use that to water all my plants. And then um, if I'm harvesting my bin, like totally harvesting it, and I always recommend you harvest your bin at least once or twice a year, like harvest the whole entire thing, I'm going to dump the entire contents out on a large piece of cardboard or a tarp. I'm going to do it on a sunny or a very bright day, and I'm just going to um, take all my castings and form them into cones, into small piles. Again, worms don't like the light. So every pile that I make, they're crawling down to the bottom of it. So I'm going to be able to scrape off the top of the castings uh, until I see worms again. And then as they start to go down, I continue to do that for each pile. So I'll end up with a pile of worms, which I'll reintroduce back into my bin, start all over from scratch with the wet paper, the food, the wet paper, and the dry paper. And then I'll take my castings and I generally just put them in a, um, I have one of those old plastic buckets that kitty litter came in and I'm going to leave them in that. If there's some worms or some roly polies that hitch a ride on it, I'll just let them kind of hang out in my finished castings. That shouldn't be a problem. And then I'm going to leave it, but I'm not going to close the lid all together. I'm just going to let it be kind of let it be. I don't want it to get too wet, nor do I want it to dry out. This kind of keeps like a nice little, nice little balance. That's me harvesting. That's my travel bin. Get a lot of eggshells. But when you water them, they leach out calcium into the soil, which is really key for on um, the rigidity of a lot of fleshy annual stems. It really kind of increases their ability to handle the wind or handle, you know, getting bumped or knocked over. <clears throat> this is the color I'm looking for. I hope you can see these are diluted worm castings. So as you can see, it's a, you know, it's a little kind of dilute, a little muddy. Um, that's the color you're looking for. Because if you use too many, um, it could be detrimental. It could kill your plants. So you're going to want to treat that accordingly. Uh, always err on the side of, you know, maybe it needs to be a little bit more diluted because you can always add more. And generally speaking, a lot of my plants, um, since I do grow primarily in containers, um, everybody gets castings probably about every five to six weeks or something like that until they start to flower and fruit, of course. All right. I talked about banking your browns in the fall. So collect those leaves and keep them dry somewhere in your garage, your backyard, under something um, to keep them dry. I told you about the magic of chicken manure and compost thermometers. If you really want to nerd out, I mean, a compost thermometer is always nice to kind of keep track of um, how hot things get or how the hot things don't get as well. And sometimes it's just fun, but it's not necessary. Again, um, your bin will tell you everything you need to know when you take that lid off. If it's shrunken, if it's going through a hot period, if something is kind of a miss, you'll be able to, you'll know as soon as that lid goes. All right. And there we go. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, my contact information is there. So if you have any questions about composting or gardening in general, please feel free to um, reach out to me. Um, again, you can find me on Instagram or Facebook. I have a couple of pages where I list all my other classes as well as tips and tricks or, you know, you can come out and um, nerd out with me garden wise. That was amazing. Thank you so much, Laura. I appreciate You're welcome. that. Thank you. You're welcome. My pleasure. Awesome. Well, we're wrapping up towards the end. We will have a few minutes if there, there's just a few questions. Um, However, if any of you need to leave, we have been recording. We will also be sending a 
um, a follow-up email with a handout with a bunch of resources and a link to the recorded webinar. So you can always replay it, look at the slides. Um, and yes, Lori was so kind and has her information so you can always ask if you don't get to ask it this evening follow up with her um and yeah thank you so much Lori, for your time we really appreciate it um oh, i'm gonna take back the screen real fast i just want to provide a few resources for people do you want me to stop sharing here yeah i got you um can you all see my screen yeah all right. Well, everyone, um, we are currently hiring here at Daily Acts. We have three really exciting positions. We have our bilingual uh, program coordinator, our senior development coordinator, and our communications. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out or contact me at the end of this webinar, or you can go to dailyacts.org slash job revision openings. <laughs> I forget the dash. Um, and yeah, and we just, of course, want to say thank you to our sponsors and the city of Petaluma, which is making this event happen. And of course, um, we are just so thankful for all of you who helped make these programs run. If you feel so generous, of course, we are always um, accepting donations as a nonprofit. And yeah, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm just going to, we have about five more minutes. So if anyone has any questions, we can, you know, take it away. I know there was probably like two that I saw. And I also have a question as well. So um, Go for I'm, it. yeah, I'm curious as to, um, you know, I was, I was really surprised by the frequency of, of you um, needing to like layer from the browns and the greens. Um, is there like a, a good technique for like storing like those leaves in any specific spot or how do you organize like all of the material to make it you know accessible uh safe so the material's not getting wet or other critters aren't getting into it um is there any safe practices as well well as far as the leaves are concerned like i said i always try to you know put them in like um probably plastic trash bags that i attempt to try to reuse every year if, if i if i can and just to kind of store them in a place where they're not going to get wet for the most part. I mean, they'll still work if they get wet, but they're always better if they can try to be, um, if you can try to uh, enter them into their dry, for sure. So, you know, overhangs, your garage, you know, if you have a shed. Um, like I said, I have an old um, trash can with a lid. I just, you know, keep them in there and kind of keep them in the corner of my garden, you know, even if it's outdoors, because the lid is going to keep, uh, keep things dry. Awesome. Thank you. Julia asked a question saying that there's a person on Craigslist selling buffalo beetles and isopods for compost. Um, are those native chewers? I don't know anything about buffalo beetles. Isopods, that's just like roly polies. Um, uh, those are just like roly polies, but I don't know why people are selling them. I mean, they're everywhere. If you ever need to collect them, um, all you really have to do is just take a piece of cardboard and wet the ground and put the piece of cardboard down and come back a couple days later. There'll be roly polies and worms underneath there for sure. So I'm not sure. And what a buffalo, <clears throat> buffalo beetle? I wouldn't have to Google that. I Googled it. They're definitely not native to California. I was reading that they're like native to Europe. I think that there's a quite a, you know, you can kind of go in your own backyard to go for a hike. And I, I think that you could collect. Um, Lori, I'm curious, would you, if you wanted to get roly polies into your compost bin, do they organically kind of show up themselves? Like some of the, the, the larvae and things like that? Yeah, absolutely. If, especially that's another one of the key things about putting your basic bin on the soil. So you're just basically, I mean, it's a perfect situation for them. They're very limited predators in a basic compost pile. So you can live your life out pretty clutch. You know, there's food, there's water, the ability to mate and make other offspring. And you're pretty much pretty much left alone. So yeah. So if you put it on the ground, then definitely, the, you know, it's a kind of like a, if you build it, they will come 
kind of scenario. So I have people ask me questions, well, should I get worms for my basic pile? And my, first, my question to you is no, they will come. It's free food, protection, all kinds of stuff. They will be there and working very hard for you. Beautiful. And uh, we have one, time for one more. Um, and I, someone asked, what is an example of uh, a wrong green? Wrong greens to put in. Um, like I said, dog and cat feces would be a wrong green. Um, a cooked food situation would be a wrong green. Um, anything that's poisonous or toxic, any toxic plants like hemlock or poison oak or um, anything kind of like that. So yeah, if you stay, but here's to say, I'm giving everyone kind of like a basic recipe and I encourage you to, you know, if you're interested in, you know, experimenting with certain things, seeing how long things will take to break down, that's always fun. I always try to um, test out, you know, biodegradable stuff. So I usually take like an old onion bag or a mesh bag. I'll put it in there and put it on a string and put it in the pile and then just pull it out occasionally to see how long it's taking to break down. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that part's always fun. Or um, get a coffee cup, like say you go to Starbucks or Pete's or something, uh, and get a coffee cup and put that in your worm bin. And you'll notice that mm -hmm. the inside of the coffee cup is lined with plastic so it doesn't leak. Um, all the worms will eat all the cardboard off of it and leave that plastic sleeve intact, totally intact uh, inside your bin. So sometimes that's always fun, especially if you have kids. That's always a fun thing. And kids love to maintain worm bins and play with the roly polies and stuff. So if you're trying to kind of get everybody on board for it, um, that's a great carrot. Thank you. All right, we are at our time for this evening, but thank you so much, Lori, for joining Daily X and for all of you for coming on tonight. I know Zoom fatigue is a real thing, and I just appreciate you all spending your time with us this evening. And I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. All right, thank you so much, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I appreciate it. Thank you.